We're about to get started, and I just have a couple announcements, and then Ken will come up as well. Or no, Ken won't come up <laughs> as well. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Well, come on up. Uh, I just want to remind everyone that these are amazing mugs. Keep calm and trust the dramaturg, and they are for purchase at registration. We do not want to have to ship them back, so Ken is actually... <laughs> there we go, some modeling, thank you. Great, all of these, all of these selling points. Uh, and the other thing I want to remind people of is that we actually do have three copies of the New England New Play Anthology, which was mentioned at Hot Topic. Uh, and this is a suggested $25 donation. But once again, if you really love it, um, just come up to the registration. Um, let's see. Otherwise, I think we'll get the day going. We have our banquet coming up tonight. There will be more information about that. Don't forget to sign up for Pride. I'm going to be sending out an email to everyone with all of the information about our rendezvous point and all of that stuff today. So make sure you get your name and your email on that list. And we're going to be making a pride banner at lunch today. All right. That's all I can remember at this point. Stay tuned for more info. And I'm going to bring up Brian Quirt. Thanks, Coriana. Thank you for everything that you've been doing and for si for surviving your wicked cold this week. I'm excited to talk about this. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Sacred Sock and this session on uh, the uh, Bly Creative Capacity Grant project that she has been working on over the course of this winter. Um, uh, this is the third of our three uh, Bly Grant sessions this conference. Uh, there was an excellent one uh, uh, in the upstairs room yesterday about the Spiderweb show and their uh, TBN studio. A number of you came to that. It's a really remarkable project, and I urge you to go to spiderwebshow.ca to learn more about that project that was funded last year. Um, and th there's a number of other people who've been here this week who were funded in pre previous years, and I just wanted to acknowledge them. Uh, and if you have a chance to speak to them while they're here about their projects, which have been remarkable, and, and many of which are ongoing but, but are heading towards conclusion. Uh, Philippa Kelly and Lydia Garcia were funded in our first year to create a diverse dramaturgy online handbook. Uh, Dennis Perrin, who's not here today, but uh, uh, was funded in the first year as well to, to work on a piece called Memory Ring with the dramaturgs. Heidi Taylor and Jan Derbyshire uh, from Vancouver uh, were working on a project called A Hacker Approach to Inclusion that um, will also have an online component that we will disseminate. Catalin Tresenyi uh, created a book about dra branch dramaturgy that has been published and things that were funded. Uh, Last year, Sarah Elkashev uh, from Playwrights Workshop Montreal, who was also here this weekend, um, uh, created a piece with um, a group of physics uh, professors in uh, both countries, the US and Canada. Kelly Kerwin created a piece in Brooklyn. Um, Sally Olov, who's been here and who led two sessions yesterday, uh, was also funded last year uh, through the Bearded Ladies Cabaret. And then uh, last year, of course, was Sarah Stern with the Spiderweb show. So I just wanted to acknowledge and, and um, uh, congratulate all of those artists for the projects that they've been working on for the Bly Creative Capacity Grant. Remind all of you that applications for next year are, um, uh, uh, the deadline is September 15th. All the information is now available on the lmga.org website. Please feel free to go visit it. Consider an application for yourself, for your organization, or perhaps for other artists or organizations who are doing innovative, boundary-expanding dramaturgical work that you think uh, could be funded or could be funded by the Bly Project. And I also wanted to thank Jess Hutchison for working with us last year on the Bly Capacity Grant uh, uh, to make it all possible to uncover the promising potential of this work. Um, and on that happy note, uh, that brings us to this year's uh, recipients. And Phaedra Scott's proposal uh, with um, uh, Black Creative Commons was uh, uh, unanimously supported by all of our panelists. And we're thrilled that you were here to take us inside what it's going to be for the Bly. Thank you, Phaedra. Thank you. Uh, so I just want to start by saying thanks, everyone in the LMGA. Uh, thanks, Mark Bly, specifically, for creating this 
Well, I do. It's a long capacity grant, um, and there's a lot that I want to cover um, because I really want feedback from the names of dramaturgs about this project. Um, so I'm going to start with what Black Theatre Commons is. Uh, it started off in 2014 at the San Diego PCG Conference as a, the Black Affinity Conference. Uh, a lot of theater, a, a bunch of black theater artists got together and they were like, well, what do black artists need in America? How can black artists survive? And the unanimous decision was uh, sustainability, like financial security and sustainability, because um, it was one of those times where you realize uh, about, I think it was something like in the 90s, uh, there were about 17 black theaters in Bork. Um, and as of, I think, last year, there's 11. Uh, and clearly the funding for black theaters has gone away. Uh, and there's really a problem about funding about those structures. Um, at the after the PCG conference, Black Theater Commons uh, worked together with HowlRound and the Cuba Libre Act for Folk uh, meeting where they developed their mission statement. And their mission statement was, like I said, sustainability in black theater. It's networking among black theater artists, but also this idea of how can we become a national organization? How can we all really support each other and speak up for each other? Uh, and so that's where it all started. Um, what's so fascinating about Black Theater Commons is that it is very strictly non-hierarchical. That is 100% like a different kind of leadership structure. Everybody who wants to be involved with whatever is allowed to. Uh, and so it's split off into different committees. And if you want to be in whatever committee, you can and like have whatever amount of involvement you can. Understanding that right now it's volunteer, but with the goal of actually hiring people, actually hiring producers, and, uh, and actually hiring people across the country to work together and to support black theater. Um, a part of this grant um, started like years ago, actually. Um, it was at the New York Theater Conference where uh, I was there and I was thinking, what are ways that we can monetize dramaturgy? Um, what are ways that we can do that through technology? Um, and part of that came from, well, what, what happens if we like put our, like, for lack of a better word, like our actual practice online and start having them be available to purchase as a right? So that way you can always have like your, the research that you did like years ago, but if people are like, hey, I'm really interested in that August Wilson book, they don't have to reinvent the wheel to see the dramaturgy that was already done. Um, that it's a way for dramaturgs to be supported um, with work that they've already done. Uh, and to like continue building on that kind of profile. Uh, and so after going to the IMDA conference, I, um, I went to my first uh, PCG conference where I met uh, Black Theater Commons for the first time. And I was like, hey, would it be cool if I applied for this grant but did this for Black Theater Commons? And everyone was unanimously like, yeah, sure, do it. We're non-hierarchical. Um, uh, so <laughs> quite wonderful, the amount of support. Um, by national organization, like think about how much every black theater administrator um, gave to PCG. They are within Black Theater Commons. Uh, and so after applying for the grant and doing a lot of research about how black people connect to other black people, realizing that the black theater community is spread among like 12 different Facebook pages and like eight different kinds of email listers, realizing that there is a complete need to unify and to have like this one central place that we can all go to. Um, and also inspired by the Latinx Theater Commons and all the work that they've been doing. Um, and how with the more exposure that they have, like the more united and like the more, or like it's just like this really beautiful kind of, uh, we can do this um, and we can unite. We just have to like actually work together and do that. Um, <coughs> so for our first round of this grant, the first step is developing a database of black theater artists and administrators um, who I identify as part of the Latinx Club. So this is an international organization of black theater artists um, what we support a lot. Uh, and so by administrators and artists, I mean like directors, dramaturgs, uh, playwrights, designers, um, like development people, anybody that is, is in theater that identifies as part of the black diaspora can be involved in black theater commons. Um, and part of the website, which I will show you a very, very, very beta version of, is to uh, split off into these different sections, and so that way individuals and institutions can be like, hey, I don't know any black writing designers. Oh wait, there's blacktheatercommons.org, um, and you can just click on writing designers and see, see them all, or, or at least see as many as we have on the first call, uh, very few. Uh, and so eliminating hierarchies was something that was like very important to me, um, like really inspired by the Kill Boys who started doing that among women playwrights and realizing that any kind of marginalized community actually 
screen because um, visibility is really real. Um, and there's always, there is that excuse of like, ah, it's too hard to find. Um, and I don't think so. <laughs> so in addition to that, um, there's also going to be a very visibility-based component. So part of a lot of my job responsibilities on stage is doing a lot of like history shows. So me as, a, as an individual, I do an incredibly fascinating job of history. Um, I, uh, I also have a, I have a degree in drama and a degree in history. Um, and I have simultaneously worked in museums and theaters at the same time. Uh, and so I wanted to create a time capsule of black theater's passage of, of those 16 other world theaters that no longer exist, of the first black theater in America in 1841 that nobody really goes back to see those theaters because now it's New York City. Uh, and to have, to have that living memory online um, of what is still reality and still in film. Um, and part of what I've been doing so far in like my tenure with research is starting off with the roster, which is a resource created by HowlRound of um, the, a list of black theaters in America. And as I'm going through that, it's actually been really um, illuminating and depressing uh, seeing a bunch of theater companies who some are very active and then some who haven't been able to produce. Um, and I'm being like, wow, I had this like really great idea, but understanding that perhaps, like seeing the need for this idea, but also seeing that um, why hasn't like why hasn't anything done why why hasn't anything been done before? Um, the last part of this is the monetizing drama theater aspect of the piece of of developing um, this list of black theater companies and drama producers and black theater drama like by black dramaturgs to create this like this funding structure for drama teams that I really I want to share with everybody and that if you're interested in this I want to like talk about it and like make it applicable for every single dramaturg um, because I think that it's something that as as dramaturgs as people who work in such ephemeral spaces that you work on that show and while that show has like a shelf life longer than you are often you know there's no more credit after that you have that one thing and then you can no longer like dust down those laurels in ways that like playwrights can or ways that other artists can even though you do have that lasting impact on your show uh, and so it's black theater commons is by no means exclusive to me um, and it is something that I, I strongly believe that there's room for all of us and that from my corner I'm, I want to do the best that I can and cross pollinate with every single person every single kind of uh, community that wants to be involved and wants to learn how to to be sustainable, to be financially sustainable, to be an artist and not have to worry about that issue. Um, uh, so where we are now um, is a very, very early infrastructure phase of the journey. Uh, I'm working with graphic, a graphic designer and the Empress Theater program, which has been really uh, amazing because both of them have never worked in theater before. Um, and so the kind of graphics that you would have for the corporation is actually quite different than the ones that you would have for a nonprofit organization, which um, I'm realizing. So I'm going to actually show you part of the website that is there. Um, and it's um, not not quite yet, um, but like it's, um, it's yeah, <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, no, <laughs> no thank, thank you. Um, just, I also want to make sure that you have the understanding that it's 100% going to change um, and that the graphics that you're seeing are graphics that um, this is the first time members of Black Theater Commons are seeing this. Um, this is the very first time that um, like anyone is actually seeing this type of construction. Um, so it's 100% new and I'm happy to share it with you because I you just see that idea in it. Um, and the best way, I think that the best way to do this is to ask, um, to ask everyone to at all of the points of participation. Um, and so with that in mind, also the structure of it is like kind of all over the place. I got a chance to take a look at it um, yesterday because I was given the website two days ago. Um, and like I already have my own set of questions about organization that I'm going to pose to you as well. Um, in addition to the just nuts and bolts of like how this thing looks, it's the capacity is like issue of this website, which is why um, we are with the grant hiring a programmer as well. Because if this website is going to have all of these things, then what size does that mean for a website? How can we make sure that people like our members that we stay in contact with? What is it setting up a newsletter for a website? And what is it setting up like a price system for people to get paid through a website? Um, and like kind of all of those logistical things. Um, and now um, going again 
I'm, I'm also realizing that I think I'm going to have to be consulting a lawyer in terms of rights um, of, of presenting plays by playwrights. Uh, and so right now, um, there is a play on the website but it's a play by Kirsten Zenich, who is a friend of mine and a player that I've worked with many times. So I, I have received her permission to put this on the website for the purposes of this presentation. Um, and if you would want to take a look at it also on your phones or devices while we're going through this, it is blacktheatercommons.org. Um, Peter is um, our chief. And today and probably tomorrow are going to be the only two days that the play will be live. Because uh, it's going to go back into development phase uh, because it's very, it's still very new. So um, please, if you have an opportunity today or tomorrow to look at the site and you're like looking at organizational structures, just email me um, or email blackcommons.org, which is at the bottom of the website, which is another email that I have access to uh, with any kind of thoughts or ideas that you have that we, it's in case we don't cover it during this session. Um, <coughs> so uh, one question that was asked by, by Megan uh, actually was, would that kind of, dramaturgical resource replace dramaturgs in the room um, of having like this, this uh, online resources essentially. Um, and that was something that I was thinking about. And the idea of it is that this should only be supplemental, this kind of resource, and that having a resource um, is like, you're just not reinventing the wheel all the time of doing a production that's been done in the last few years. That you can actually focus on working on the project that you are working on and seeing whatever spin that that community makes um, or whatever co that that theater company is doing. So that way, focusing actually on the art that you are doing as opposed to the art that needs to be done. Um, and I think part of that makes it really freeing and that kind of really helps, I believe that it can really help dramaturgs be a, a bigger presence because taking, taking work out of that ends up being hours and hours of time. Um, <laughs> so the goal of this is to create a website that will be self-sustaining. Uh, so that way, everybody will be using it, dramaturgs will be getting paid, the website will be getting paid through all of these other things. Um, and I also really hope that every dramaturg who is engaged to do this gets a, like a flat fee based on the IMDA contract. Uh, so right now, um, uh, we are 100% not in the contract phase yet, but once we do, every dramaturg who is engaged to create like the actor packet portion will be paid a fee. Um, and will be paid like a fee of what I'm, I'm going to say it because that's what it's going to be, of $300. Um, and so that, of like research that you could do in your house. Um, and because uh, I really believe that we have to start treating each other like artists and we have to start being like, do this for free and then maybe this will happen. No, I think it should come from, you're getting paid to do this work. And in addition to getting paid to do this work, you're also going to be continue to be paid for the work that you've already done. Um, and it has to start from somewhere. And I think that's what's so wonderful about Black Theater Commons is that we're very like, understanding that what some of it is is volunteer right now, but that we have to pay each other and we have to make space for each other. Um, <coughs> and uh, with Fly, it's been really wonderful having conversations with Yvette Nolan about structure and like, and she's been, she's been really fantastic talking about structure about how this website could possibly function of being like, all right, let's just do exact, ev like everything, have everything and then figure out what we can't do later on. But I don't think that there's anything that we can't do. Um, so let's walk through the website. Uh, thank you. So I wanna go through the individual pages um, and kind of go through what, what these things are. I'm going to move. Uh, this is a little preliminary logo. There's actually a few logos that are thrown around this page because I've asked the graphic designer just to put all the preliminary ones up and then we'll like figure out which one we like the best. Um, and so this is what you see when you go to blacktheatercommons.org. If you scroll down, we're gonna go back to dramaturg and back, uh, but we'll start with database. We'll just click on um, learn more. Again, learn um, a lot of the words that are on this website are like, um, oh, are like, oh yeah, blah, blah, blah. This is what this is going to be. <laughs> So if you look down, uh, like it's just the same stock canvas logo, but ideally, um, instead of like these names, it'll be sorted by sections of like designers and users um, and directors, dramaturgs, people, whatever you end up specifying. Uh, so we could go back. Uh, the next section is theaters. So uh, this is uh, the section where I became very depressed. 
uh, because what I did when I started doing it was going through it quarter by quarter. So uh, if we go to California and we go to um, the Black Repertory Group, uh, so if you go scroll down, so I was able to find like a huge amount of information for Black Repertory, um, and so each theater will have like here's the mission statement that is on that theater, here's the specific history behind that theater, um, and then going down to there's formatting things. I'm like, why is this censored? But I've never you know read it. Um, and then uh, and then going on further, like what is the social impact of this theater? As in like what is the kind? What are the kind of community engagement initiatives that this theater does? Um, and as well as production history, which surprisingly it's very difficult to find production history. Um, and so it's kind of I have to do a lot of one-on-one um, -on -one emails of like, can you just send me this so I can put this on this website and then maintain this relationship with you as you continue to work. Uh, if we go back, um, and let's go to uh, African American Drama Company. Uh, so this is one that if you scroll down, I can. The website is there, but there's no And um, the last production was in 2016. Uh, and uh, it, it was on the, the list at HowlRound, and it was like, this is not good. Just understanding like there's going to be blockages of like what kind of information you have access to, and like who actually knows these people. So if anyone online, and anyone here, has information on like theaters, black theaters specifically, of how to contact people, please let me know. Uh, because everyone should be included. I don't want to have like, no information about um, anything. Um, if we go back, and we go to the mission um, statement. So uh, if you go down, it goes over like the, the mission and then the three factors of the mission statement. Uh, I want to stop at value um, with the pertaining black theaters to make sure that the non higher health care and also money that we were to put into the theater. Uh, which was essential in black theater commons because uh, part of the reason why black theater commons decided to uh, not partner with Emerson was to to work with Hattie Lee Theater Company um, uh, in order to uh, like Hattie Lee Theater Company became black theater commons to become a sponsor um, and we wanted to create an institution where you can just do this and have this just a kind of leadership stru structure but also not to you can in, like invite allies in the room if they want to but also have the option to not and have it not be something that is punishing or something that is trusting. Um, so if we go back. Uh, and then if we go down to membership, this is a part that I um, don't know anything about. Uh, so if you if you have any ideas. Um, so right now, it's still in preparing for Black Theater Commons. Like as long as anybody who identifies as a part of the Black Theater Commons are out, and then anybody who identifies as an ally. Um, and uh, some like, in our conversations, part of it was like, could this resource be available or be available for free for black theater artists, but be like a low pay for allies? Um, and so that's a very ongoing conversation that we're having. Because like my impulse is, is yes, but like understanding that there's kick, like whatever, there's always kickback. It doesn't matter. Um, all right, so I guess that's my answer from all of you. Uh, let's go back. Uh, and let's go back up to drama. So this is the section that I really want to uh, go through and also ask all of you about. Um, if we scroll down, ideally this will be formatted completely differently again um, because it's been done once before. Uh, so it will be split up alphabetically with plays written by people who identify as kick black by Alex Cobb. If we scroll down, how about the writing? So this is where we split. Um, so let's quick go really quickly. How Stop the Writing is a play about the Black Theater Theater Group and how they came into production. Um, and what this was, because it's a history-based play, there was a lot, a lot of um, resources that are like related to this. But as I was developing the material, I realized that you can't have a template for any single Black Theater Commons. Um, and also, but, but having that, what because this is a paid resource, what is the minimum that it has to be? Uh, and so that's my question to all of you. Like, should there be a minimum, like, what is the minimum amount of, like, primary and secondary sources? What is the minimum amount of, like, high definition photographs? Because understanding that if this is paid, there has to be some sort of structure that does that. Because uh, it's, yeah. Um, and uh, let's just go down. Uh, 
uh, me also, uh, as, as a dramaturg, uh, I'm a very visual person, a very visual partner. Uh, and so graphics and pictures make a lot more sense to me. Uh, and so a lot of my dramaturgy is based on images. Uh, and so this is like a sideshow that I think that no matter what, every single kind of actor's market online out there, there will be another Karen at some point, right, will have this kind of visual reference for people. Um, <coughs> scroll down really quick because I'm getting slow. So you can come down here if I can find it. Um, and I'm splitting my slides into three areas that I think you need to see, but we've all done these kinds of big things. And um, having that opportunity to have things customizable to that dramaturg is really awesome. But I'm wondering, what do you think are mandatory questions that should be there? Uh, so let's just start with, with the key questions. Like, what is the threshold of like what should be minimum, minimally required as well as like what should ha like what has to be there in terms of creating a story that makes sense. Um, yeah. Um, this uh, might not directly answer your question, but it it might be nice um, as an addition to the um, research if. Um, there were articles you could pay to reprint in your program, or pieces of this that you yeah. could, for an extra fee to the original author, re-include in your program. That's something that I think would be really valuable, to, especially to include other voices in the program of the theater who might be doing the play. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Any other? <laughs> also, Rebecca Adelshein is taking notes for me, so she's looking at that. Yeah. Um, I wonder if maybe there's, like, some kind of peer review stuff we can steal from the scholarship and academic world in this, um, especially if it's like plays that are being produced repeatedly, maybe you're like, okay, find a dramaturg and a director that worked on this and like cross check each other and, and get that kind of sign off. Or, or maybe it's somebody like you or someone else in the organization that is reviewing it the way like a supervisor in a literary management role would or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Just because it's so individual, then you have someone to cross check the work. Yeah, uh, yeah, something I didn't actually think about. Thank you, thank you. Um, hey, so I was at, I was thinking to myself as you were, this is an amazing resource, by the way. Congratulations. Oh, thank you, thank you. It's like really amazing. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> thank you. So two things I was thinking about. One is, one has to do with images and um, who holds rights to them and how do we, because uh, I, I feel like in the realm of dramaturgy, often the images that we are harvesting for use in the rehearsal room are not images we're seeking rights for because we're not publishing them, right? So we are, we're sort of like scraping images from anywhere, trying to sort of help our collaborators see the world of the play in some specific way. So in this, I, I think you are spot on, that the images are highly important. And then the question is, if that's a section that becomes a paid section, who are you gonna pay for those images, and how are you, what kind of time is going to be required to track down the rights to those? I mean, that is like a whole time job in and of itself. So I'm, I'm curious about that. Yeah. And then the other thing I was thinking about is your question of what sections have to be represented in any given um, resource, mm -hmm. right? And my impulse, though I don't know that this is helpful, my impulse is to say no required sections. I mean, except maybe for like a blurb or something that like, oh, yeah. right? Because I, I think one of the things that um, happens when we sort of shoehorn plays into pre-existing structures is that plays that have weird needs um, don't, are not able to be f uh, inside a flexible container to accommodate them, right? So I'm almost curious, like how do you build something that has the rigor that you're looking for that also is wildly flexible so that a play that is like totally non-traditional or like is a devised piece or is, you know, is or a movement piece like that wouldn't have figures in it or historical references. Like, right, like how do you make sure that the resource you're creating is um, able to accommodate any and every performative uh, moment that you want to document? I don't know the answer to that, sorry. Yeah, me either. <laughs> A <laughs> uh, couple of things. Good morning. Um, 
first thank you for engaging with the question that I had the chance to ask earlier in the conference about the kind of population and money flow. And I'd love to stay in a long conversation about that if you know, when and if you are interested in that. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. Second thing, I want to I want to tie together what Alana and Sarah offered because my thoughts are related to theirs. That I too found as soon as I started thinking about plays, the possibility of categories that served all those plays seemed to eliminate itself. Um, and in its place came the I an idea based on how rounds intensive editing process with the written material that is published through HowlRound's various venues. And I wonder whether instead of a template of categories, instead a, if you want to put material into this part of this site for potential uh, purchase later, you know that you're engaging in what's going to be a long, rigorous, intensive dialogue and development process with an editor dramaturg mm -hmm. or the dramaturgical materials so that it may m be possible to have each plays and dramaturgs offering be much more individualized, but still re meet that level of rigor that you're craving. Mm -hmm. Third thing, and then I'm going to sit down and shut up. Um, because I work now primarily as an educator, I look at this and say, A, I would love to make my students a resource for your making of this resource. Uh, in that I could imagine that if at some point as you work through this and develop it, you could use squadron support to research and or make and or organize a thing. I think my students would be a wonderful resource and the opportunity would be a great resource for me to put in a course for them. So please use us if we can be useful to you. But on the other hand, I'm not going to want your students to use my students to use this <laughs> because I want them to develop the skills of doing their own research so that eventually they will be qualified to provide material through this resource if that suits them and the resource. So I'm starting to think about how to introduce Black Theatre Commons when you're ready to roll it out and yet also embargo it. So it's not like one stop uh, shopping for student resource yeah, or for student yeah, research. Yeah, Thank yeah. you for permitting the length of this comment. <laughs> so I, I have some sp I have some specific information about those Bay Area black theaters for you. I'll catch you yeah. And okay. some that you don't have on there yet. So mm -hmm. um, number one. Number two, I know I'm gonna talk I've got all this um, I also spent a lot of time in the classroom and one of the things I thought immediately was I would pay to use an article from this for classroom use. Um, the there are only I think it may be problematic to fund the website. The amount of money you would need to fund this website might be problematic to fund specifically just through dramaturgy because there are only so many plays happening in a year, you know. Um, and if and there are jillions of plays happening all the time, right? So how many people are producing any one play for which you have dramaturgy on the site, right? Mm -hmm. But a zillion of us are teaching plays in the classroom all the time. And often, am I going to teach this play or that play or what am I going to put on my survey course? If I find an amazing article, I'm like, okay, I'm going to teach this one and then I have this great article, I would absolutely pay to use an article in my classroom. Sure. Uh, and I, this will be my last thing, and then I'll sit down and shut up, which is that um, I absolutely would pay for an ally membership. I think that's absolutely fair to have it be for black artists, members of Black Theatre Commons free, and everybody else pay a monthly fee. And I would also like to see a higher monthly fee for organizations. Yep, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I would force my... Very <laughs> right because it's there's nothing more useful than this, and I just want to say this is a genius yeah. move, and I just peed it as much. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> so thank you, and uh, I had an idea about how to review the plays. I wonder if you'd set yourself up for a financial challenge if you hired an editor who would then be devoting a ton of time and would then need to be paid as well. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if as a part of the package of an artist delivering a packet, they'd also review two other packets so that, I if I'm doing my math right, two uh, uh, separate dramaturgs from the one producing the packet would mm -hmm. review the material. Um, and then 
I don't know if that might be too much of an ask for the the compensation that you're thinking of giving, but just a thought. Right, yeah, thank, I think that's a, a wonderful idea. And like right now where I am in, in the process is that I am not planning on actually doing any kind of service, but to be that open um, and, and just to really reach out and engage some other black philanthropists specifically. But I think long term, when we think about finances, that's something very, yeah, thank you. Um, so I was a few minutes late, so I missed the intro to this, so I apologize if you covered this. Um, but I have a question in terms of uh, the scope of what is trying to be provided. I mean, I know f personally for myself as a dramaturg, I rarely just give a packet. Like most of my actor packets are workshops or activities or um, things that engage the cast with the information um, instead of giving them something to read. Um, so I'm wondering ab about whether the intent is to simply provide like the research aspect of what could potentially go into an actor's packet um, or if it was supposed to be something that was an all-inclusive like I as a dramaturg would take this and say and just give it or um, yeah those are my questions yeah. yeah like or would I just distribute it as is or would I have the if I bought the packet, would I then have the flexibility to, like, change it and enlarge it or, uh, yeah. That, that I think that's the ongoing, like, kind of lawyery kind of question that we're going to be engaging with uh, further on. But uh, I also forgot there's one section of this website that is not on there um, is the media, which will host, like, live, live streams of potential, like, projects or lectures by black theater artists as well as that video com component of like, hey, here's this workshop that I've done, but the best medium for me to present this is in a video that I'm going to post on this site. Uh, and so that would be a part of like the other like kind of service that we might do. Hi, um, I'm Brad Rothbart. Um, I, I wanna thank you for all the really wonderful work you're doing. It's quite amazing. And I, also, I have two ideas. One is that the paucity of information on a lot of the black theaters is not an impediment as it is, but it's also a reason for this to exist. Um, so I would say take it as a first principle rather than a problem to be solved, and we can use that in terms of getting this work out, in terms of getting it filled, those lines filled. Also, along that line, I would say that to say, rather than trying to have a lawyer or someone source every image and make sure that you're using it legally, to say, we as a small organization have done the very best we can. If you see an image that is yours and you wish that to be taken down, we will do so with that image. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we have one minute left. Oh, uh, <laughs> okay, I'll go yeah. quick. Hi, uh, Leslie, she, she, her, hers. Um, this is thinking uh, circles out a little further. I'm just curious, because I'm a big fan of uh, Asian American museums, because it's work that's been, history that's been created and curated by and for us. Have you thought about partnering with African American and black museums? Such so a great resource. Yes. A and and yes. maybe for funding with them, too. Mm -hmm. um, also, uh, something I'd love to think down the line with you about is in our community, more than 50% um, are mixed heritage now. So uh, the Kata, you know, Consortium of Asian American Theaters and Artists, Latino Commons, uh, Theater Commons, and I know Native and Indigenous are starting to organize. I'd love to, uh, for us to have a conversation about how we're all getting together and representing multiracial folks. Yeah, because I, I was actually speaking about like Afro-Latinos know? Yes, yeah, yes. Like, um, there's La Latinx Theater Commons um, and now Black Theater Commons. Uh, and yeah, yes. And I can't wait to start, like, let's get together. I, I'm yeah, so we have mixed hearted in our community, too, where we all, the intersections are incredible. So that'd be awesome. Yeah, Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Well, we are out of time. I am here. Let's talk. Please look at the website, email. Thank you.